Our passage today continues in Genesis, starting in chapter 6, verse 9, through chapter 7, verse 5. Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds. Of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come with you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I shall send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Well, thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, this morning we are, she mentioned, continuing our sermon series um, in the book of Genesis. And as we do, we come to one of the most well-known stories um, in all of the Bible, uh, the story of, of the flood, the story of, of Noah's Ark. And so movies have been made, um, children's books have been written, um, nursery rooms have been filled with images and pictures of this story. And so it's a little challenging, uh, to be honest, to be able to preach on a story uh, that's so well known. But as we dig into this passage this morning, we're going to take this whole story of Noah's Ark, which takes a, a few chapters here in the book of Genesis 6 and really all the way through chapter 9. We're going we're gonna to split it up into three weeks. And so I'm going to be preaching on chapter 6, verse 9, through chapter 7, verse 5, and then we'll preach the rest of chapter 7 and into chapter 8 next week, and then the week after that, finish up chapter 8 and into chapter 9. And you may wonder, well, what, why are we splitting up uh, such a, a well-known story that, like we all know, we... We could all just repeat it verbatim pretty close. So why, why split it up? Why, why, take it, why take so long? Why, why walk so slow through this specific well-known story? Well, there, there's two reasons for why we want to not just rush through this, but take it a little bit slow over the next few weeks. One would be that this story is, is one of the most important stories when it comes to the entire storyline of the Bible. In other words, when it comes to this, this story, there's, this story is, is like a key turning point in the entire storyline of the Bible. Not only that, but, but within this story, there are going to be themes that we see. They're going to reverberate and, and, and echo through 
the rest of the storyline of the Bible. And because of that then, if we just quickly just run through this or give kind of a, a kid's book version of this story and just continue on through the book of Genesis, we're going to be lost in some ways. And we're not going to really fully understand the, the whole story of the Bible if we don't understand these themes that we're going to see that are echoed and repeated throughout the rest of the story of the Bible. But not only that, the, the second reason we want to kind of take more of a slow approach to this story is because this story is very applicable and very relevant for just the world and the culture in which we live in today. Like this past week, I, I think it might have been on Tuesday or, or Wednesday, I remember coming home and Amy was there at the kitchen table, could tell like something was a little off, that something wasn't well with her, and so being the good husband that I am, I sit down, I ask, hey dear, is everything okay? And um, I knew that everything wasn't okay. Um, and she went on to tell me just, just how burdened she was, how just deeply saddened she was, just when it comes to the, the world and the culture in which we find ourselves, and specifically just how morally depraved and, and twisted and just really even wicked in an ever-increasing way that the world and, and our culture is becoming. And to be honest, specifically as it relates to just this election and on August the 2nd, the vote on August 2nd, when it comes to whether or not to remove in, in Kansas, to remove um, from the Kansas Constitution the right to an abortion, which currently exists. And she's like, really? Like, we got to vote on that? And so I'm, I'm sitting there with my wife as she's lamenting just about the depravity and the evilness, evil and, and wickedness of the world in which we live. And, and then I head downstairs to my office, begin to study and prepare for this sermon. And as I start reading this, this passage, I begin to see truths in this passage that begin to speak into and that begin to show just how directly relevant they are to the cultural moment in which we find ourselves today. And as I saw these, these truths and confronted with these truths in this passage that speak into and that are directly relevant to the world and the culture in which we live in today, they began to encourage me these truths began to fill me with, with hope. These truths began to give me, in all honesty, a, a reality check and, and a real needful perspective when it comes to just the culture and the world in which we live in today. And so that, this is what I want to do this morning. I just want to, sh I want to bring you into my office and I want to share with you the truths that God used from this passage to encourage, to fill me with hope, to give me a needful reality check and, and perspective change when it comes to the depravity in the world and the corruption of the world and culture in which we live in today. And so that's what we're going to see within this passage this morning. If you have a handout, you can see kind of at the top there, four, four lessons if you want to call them those. Four lessons, four truths that we can learn from Noah, the ark, and the flood as we live in an in ever-increasing uh, corruption and, and violence and wickedness in our world today. Lesson number one is this. It's that those who walk with God and seek to live righteous lives in this world are rare and unique. Are rare and unique. See this right from the get-go. Look at, look at verse 9 and then also in verse 10 there of chapter 6. Verse, verse 9 begins a new section here. And if you, if you remember, um, we've seen this recurring theme, this recurring refrain and phrase all throughout the book of Genesis. 
And that recurring phrase is, these are the generations of. And so then up to this point in chapter 2, verse 4, we saw these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, we saw these are the generations of, of Adam. And now as we come to chapter 6, verse 9, we see the same phrase, the same refrain. Except for this time, we see these are the generations of Noah, which include his three sons there in verse 10, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But the main point here in verses 9 and 10 is, is what it says and how, how Noah is described here in verse 9. That in verse 9, we see three descriptions or three really important truths about Noah. And the first truth we see here about Noah is that he was righteous. It says there in, in the middle of verse 9 that Noah was a righteous man. The word righteous, pretty obvious, it means to do what is right. And you're like, I had to come to church to learn that. Well, yeah, it means to do what is right. To do what is right, particularly in the eyes of God. To do what is right according to God. To do what is right according to God's standard. It means to obey God's commands. And that's what we see Noah doing over and over and over again throughout this story. That in the rest of chapter 6, we're going to see God give Noah a whole bunch of instructions. Like really precise and specific instructions. And at the very end of, of chapter 6 then, in verse 22, it says, after God gives Noah all these instructions, it says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. We see the same thing in chapter 7. The first four verses, again, God's going to give Noah more instructions, more commands. And right after he gives these more instructions and more commands, then in verse 5 of chapter 7, it again says, and Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. In other words, this is what it means to be righteous. Noah was a righteous man. He did what was right according to God's commands, according to God's instructions. But that's not all. If you look back at verse 9 there of chapter 6, it also tells us that Noah was blameless. That, that word blameless, it means pure. It, it means without blemish. And so when it comes to Noah's character, it means that his character was pure. It was without stain. It was without blemish. And then finally, at the very end of verse 9, it tells us that Noah walked with God. That he walked with God. And do you remember earlier in the book of Genesis, who, who else walked with God? Like Noah is not the first person that, that Moses, the author of Genesis, tells us walked with God. Instead, there was somebody else earlier in the book of Genesis who walked with God. And who was that? Chapter 5, verse 24, right? It was, it was Enoch. And do you remember what happened to Enoch as a result of walking with God? He didn't die. He was saved. He was delivered from death. If you remember, God, God like snatched him up. God like just one day, one day took him up. And so then as we read then the, the rest of the story about Noah, as we read about Noah walking with God here in verse 9, then we should like be on the edge of our seats. We should be wondering, oh, is the same thing going to happen to Noah that happened to Enoch? Is, is God going to save Noah from death? Is God going to deliver Noah from death? Because he walked with God, just like Enoch walked with God. And God saved him, so is God going to deliver and save Noah? That, that's the question that the reader should be asking when he reads about Noah's character as a righteous man, blameless, who walked with God. But as important as all that is, this description of Noah's character, that, that's not the ultimate point of verse 9 here. Like the ultimate point of verse 9 here isn't just to give us a description of Noah's character. Like that's, that's nice to know. Instead, the purpose of verse 9 is, is, to make a, is to contrast. Is to contrast Noah's character with the character of every single other person on the face of the earth. And, and we see this when we read the verses immediately before verse 9 and we, when we read the verses immediately after verse 9 here. And so then in the, in the verses immediately before verse 9, look at chapter 6, verse 5. It, it tells us that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
the verse after then verse 9 and, and verse 10, and look at verse 11, says that now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And so we have a sandwich going on, right? The, the verses immediately before verse 9, one, one piece of the bread. The verses verse immediately after verse 9, the other piece of the bread, they both say the same thing. They're about how everyone, how everybody on this earth was wicked, corrupt, filled with violence. But in the midst of those two verses, you have the meat of the sandwich. And in the midst of this description of, of everyone else on the face of this earth, wicked, corrupt, every intention of their heart is evil continually. The earth is filled with violence. In the middle of all of that, you have one man in verse 9 who's different from all the rest and who stands out. He, he's not like everyone else. He, he lives differently. His character's different from everyone else. He's righteous. He's blameless. He walks with God. And what's that man's name? The man's name is Noah. And so then that, that's the point of verse 9 here. Verse 9 isn't just here to give us a description of Noah's character. It's here to contrast his character with the character of the rest of humanity and to show us that he's the only one left. He's the only righteous one. He's the only one who's walking with God. In other words, he, do, he doesn't have a church like this. He doesn't have a church that he gathers together with to sing songs and pray and read scripture and hear a sermon and fellowship and all these things. Instead, he's all alone. He's standing alone. He's by himself. He's, he's walking with God, obeying God, following God while the thoughts of everyone else around him are evil continually, corrupt, filled with violence. Like, I, I wonder, like, any, anybody else here ever feel that? Like, maybe, maybe at school, you're the only Christian. You, you look around. It's all corrupt. Everybody's... Thoughts are just evil continually. The words coming out of their mouth. I'm, I feel like I'm the only one. Maybe, maybe at work. Maybe family get-togethers. Maybe your neighborhood. But you're the only one walking with God. No one else is following Christ. No one else is seeking Christ. You feel like you're the only one. It's just you. I don't know, but that's hard. Uh, that's really, really hard. And that's really, really, really lonely. But the reality is you're, you're not the only one. Like Noah. And there's other Christians throughout history and all around you today. So it's not just, it's just not you. So don't be discouraged. Keep on keeping on. That's the first lesson. Second lesson we can learn is this. It's that God sees all the corruption and violence going on in the world today. That God sees all the corruption, all the violence, all the wickedness going on in the world today. That's what we see next in verse 11 and, and verse 12. Again, verse 9 and, and 10, we saw a description of Noah. Now in verses 11 and 12, we, we see a description of the rest of humanity. We see a description of the, of the world in which Noah lives. And in verse 11 describes the rest of the world like this. Look at verse 11. Again, it says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And so then in those two verses, right, one word is used three times. You, you probably picked up on it. It's the word corrupt. It says that the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So back in that day, there weren't highlighters. There wasn't like that bold button you could press on your computer to emphasize things. There, there weren't exclamation points. Instead, the way you emphasize things was by repetition. And so Moses, the author of Genesis, he want, he's trying to emphasize something here. And what is he emphasizing? It's pretty obvious. 
everybody's corrupt. And think about what that word corrupt means. It means ruined. It means spoiled. It means twisted. And think about that, right? That's what God's good world had become. It was good, but now it's ruined. It was good, but now it's spoiled. It was good, but now it's twisted. And he says one of the primary ways the earth had become corrupt and ruined and twisted is that it was filled with violence. And just think about that. Filled with violence. Many people attacking each other, harming each other, hurting each other, committing great acts of injustice and mistreatment against each other. Like this is how far humanity had had fallen. Think about that. God had originally designed man and woman how? In, In his own image. Meaning that man and woman were to serve as God's reflection. Man and woman were to serve as God's representatives, as his vice regents who were who were to exercise dominion and to rule over God's creation on his behalf. But instead of reflecting God and imaging God and representing God here on this earth, they became all twisted and corrupted and and ruined. And now every intention of their heart, instead of reflecting God's image, is evil continually and wicked. And they're filled with corruption and, and violence. But here's the main point in all this that it's important to see. The main point is this. God sees all this. He he sees it all. Like again, this this is the point that Moses is emphasizing over and over again. Remember repetition? Look at the beginning of verse 11. He says that the earth was corrupt. Listen to this. In God's what? Sight. Very beginning of verse 12, he says that God saw the earth. If you go back a few verses earlier, go to verse 5, we see the same thing. Very beginning of verse 5, he says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Like three times, we see the same words. God saw, the Lord saw, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Maybe Moses wants us to see something here. What he wants us to see and understand is that God saw it all. He saw all the corruption, all the violence. He even saw the evil intentions in their thoughts and in their their hearts. That's how far he could could see. And this is huge for us to remember today, right? Especially in the midst of the corruption and the wickedness in the world in which we live. It's easy to think and to see all that's going on and to think, God, where in the world are you? Like, are are you asleep? Do I need to wake you up? Are you, like, preoccupied and busy with other things going on? Like, don't you see all of this mess? And what in the world are you going to do about it? Like, if you ever think that, like, don't, don't believe the lie that God doesn't see and that God doesn't know. Or that God's somehow asleep at the will or preoccupied and busy doing a whole host of other things. Instead, make no mistake about it, he sees everything. All the way down to the thoughts and the intentions of every single wicked and corrupt thought from everyone on this earth. He, he sees it all. So that's lesson two. But because he sees it all, then that leads to lesson number three. And lesson number three is this. It's that God will one day judge the corruption and violence that's going on in our world today. So what we see next in in verse 13. This is how God, God sees it, right? So now this is how God responds to what he sees. Verse 13 tells us. God finally speaks. This is what he says to Noah. He says, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them 
with the earth. And here's how he's going to do it. Look at verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, that's not the normal picture that we see in our children's books or nursery rooms. And since my oldest son is here, I probably need to apologize to him for how we decorated um, his nursery uh, when he was newborn. Um, It was a part of the story that was true, but it's the, the story that we usually think about when it comes to Noah's Ark are the cute, cuddly, smiley, fun animals. And Noah and his wife, like they're on their honeymoon or something. <laughs> we don't talk about this. There ain't any pictures of verse 17. But the reality is this. There's an aspect of this flood story that's a horror story. That's a horror story of God's judgment against sin in which everybody on the earth dies. And they don't just die, they drown. And their bodies are just spread all over the land. They all drown to death. Except for eight of them. Like that's a lot different from the smiley, cuddly, cute little animals and Noah and his wife just having a good old time. It's a picture of God's wrath that consumes and kills the whole earth except for eight people. But as horrific as that is, and it's horrific, and as sad as the judgment and the flood is, and it's sad, There's something we we need to remember. And what we need to remember is this. It's that horrific flood of judgment that we read about in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and, and 9. That pales in comparison to a future judgment that's coming. That that judgment and In Genesis 6 through through 9, it's just a preview. It's just a small little foretaste. It's just a foreshadowing of a more horrific, frightening judgment that's still to come. And, And Jesus makes this connection between the flood of judgment in Noah's day and the judgment that's going to come when he returns. And he makes this connection. You don't have to turn there. Just jot it down in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 38. Jesus is is talking here, and, and listen to what he says and the comparison he makes between the flood in Noah's day and his second coming. He says, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, listen to just how tragic this is, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Like, do you see what Jesus is doing here? He, he's moving the, this flood narrative for, from being just a nice history lesson in something that happened way back then. He's moving it 
2 being a preview and a foreshadowing and a foretaste of a judgment that's still to come when he returns. In, in other words, listen, if you're here this morning and you aren't a Christian, like, please listen, this is a warning. This is Jesus' warning. Neon lights and everything else, a warning to you. Like in Noah's day, people had no idea the flood was coming. They just thought it was raining a little bit. They were just going along with life as normal, eating, drinking, getting married, everything else. And it just kind of kept raining, kept raining, kept raining, kept raining, kept raining. Before it's too late. And they all drowned. And they all died. Like every single last stinking one of them except for eight of them. And Jesus is taking that and he's saying, and Jesus, number one, he's speaking of that if that's historically true true event as if it truly happened and he's saying the same thing is going to happen at the judgment to come when he returns it's going to be unexpected there's going to be a whole host of people who aren't going to be ready it's going to come out of the blue nobody's going to be ready for it nobody's going to see it nobody's going to be expecting it instead just one day boom there it is. And it's too late. And so then if you're, if you're here this morning, you're just messing around with the church stuff, messing around with Christianity, kind of dibbling, dabbling in it, trying to figure out, oh, maybe I'll get to that. I'm not sure. You don't have time. You don't know when this judgment is going to come. It could happen at any moment. And that's not a scare tactic from a preacher. That's the words of Jesus. And so the question is this, and I say this with as much humility and sincerity as I possibly can. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand before the judgment throne of God and give an account for your life? Are you ready to stand before him at the final judgment? Like, There's no more important question that you need to be wrestling with in your mind than, than that one. Because you have no earthly idea when that day's coming. Because when it comes, it will be unexpected. Which then begs this final question. When it comes then, is there, is there any way of escape? Is there, is there any way to be, to be rescued and, and saved and spared from this judgment that's, that's going to come? Like, how, how can I be sure? How can I know, like, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when that judgment comes, that I will be spared and saved and rescued from that judgment? Is there a way to know? Well, yeah, there, there's a way to know, and that leads to this fourth and final lesson, which is this, lesson number four. is that salvation from judgment is available to all those who are inside the ark. That salvation from judgment is available to all those who are inside the ark. Right after God tells Noah that he's going to flood the earth and, and wipe out everyone on the earth, he, he gives Noah the, these specific instructions here in verse 14. Look at there in verse 14 with me. Here's the instructions he gives to Noah. He says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch, tar. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, breadth 500 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. And so then in light of this coming future flood of judgment that's coming, 
that's going to wipe everybody out on the face of the earth, God in his mercy gives Noah a heads up. Hey, I want to tell you something that's about to happen. And so here's what I want you to do. This is mercy of God, right? This is the compassion of God. God didn't have to do this. But in his mercy, he gives Noah a heads up and he instructs him to build this massive ark. And in doing so, if you, if you catch that, he, he, he gives him precise measurements, precise dimensions, precise and specific instructions for how to build it. And so he tells him to, to make it 30, 300 cubits long. And we all read that, and we're like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. So let me do some, you know, tr measurement translation for you real quick and put it in football terms, uh, which will register for a few of you. And so 300 cubits long is 450 feet long. So that's 150 yards long, which is a football field and a half long. 50 cubits wide, which would be 75 feet wide, so 25 yards wide. And 30 cubits high, which would have been 45 feet high, so 15 yards tall. And so the way you read it, we're not really talking about a boat. We're talking about like just this massive structure. But the reason he doesn't, he, he gives these measurements as he wants Noah to, to build, obviously, this ark. But there's a reason he wants him to build this ark. That he wants Noah and his family to get into it so that they can be rescued, so they can be saved from the judgment and the flood that's about to come. And we see this in verse 18. Look what God tells Noah in verse 18. He says, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. We're going to talk about more about this covenant um, a couple weeks in, in chapter 9. Then he tells them that you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your, wi uh, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So then everyone else is going to be destroyed and die in the flood except for these people. Noah and his family. They're, they're the only people on the face of the earth that are going to be preserved, protected, kept safe from the flood of judgment. But they're not the only ones who are, who, who are going to be on the ark. Instead, look at what God tells Noah to, to bring on the ark with him in verse 19. He says, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, of, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. And then it says this, and Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So then do you see what, what's going on here? Jared mentioned this a little bit last week, and we're going to see a lot more of this next week um, in the rest of chapter 7. But what's going on here is, is a decreation and a recreation. So, so it, what's going on here is a, is a decreation. In other words, the flood is the undoing of creation. It's God reversing creation. It's God taking everything back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Like that's what he's doing with the flood when he wipes everything out. He's decreating. He's undoing creation. He's starting all over again. He's reversing creation. Rewind button. But the reason he's, he's preserving Noah and his, and his family and the reason he's telling them to bring these pairs of animals, these male and female of each of these animals on the ark is, his, is because he's going to recreate. We're going to have a decreation, an undoing of creation, and then we're going to have a recreation. We're going to start all over again. In other words, if you remember back to Genesis chapter 1, how God formed the earth, and then he filled the earth. Here in, with Noah, we have a decreation going back to the very beginning. And then he's going to refill the earth, starting with Noah and his family and starting with these pairs of, of animals. And so then, as we saw by the end of chapter 6 then, Noah did everything that God commanded. And he, and I'm assuming others with him, 
Can't imagine him doing this alone. But uh, built the ark. Look then at what God tells Noah to do next in verse 1 of chapter 7. The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So then now, the Lord's going to instruct Noah and his family to, to board the ark and to enter the ark and get on the ark. And once again, after he tells him to get on the ark, then he tells him what to bring with him on the ark. We see this in verse 2 of chapter 7. He says, Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offsprings alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I've made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And again, and Noah did all the Lord had commanded him. And so then, when you read these final instructions here in verses 2, really to verse 4, they should cause like your head to scratch a little bit. Like, like earlier, right, God, God instructed Noah to bring two of every kind of animal, every kind of bird, every kind of th- creeping thing onto the ark, a pair of each of the animals. But here, in verses 2 through 4 of chapter 7, he adds something. And he tells him to bring seven pairs of clean animals, which would beg the question, why? Why, why'd you add that? Like kind of at the very last moment before they're boarding the, the ark. Well, one of the reasons is because the ark here is a preview. It's a foretaste. It's a foreshadowing. It's a, it's a picture of the tabernacle that's eventually going to be built. That if you remember later on in Exodus, God's going to give Moses all these, what, precise measurements for how to build the tabernacle. Just like he gives Noah precise measurements for how to build the ark. And just had like the, the ark had three tiers, so the tabernacle is going to have three sections as well. The outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And, and what was inside the tabernacle? The, the ark of the covenant. Another ark where the glory of God's presence dwelled. And who is the only one allowed inside the tabernacle? The only one who is righteous. The, the priest, just like righteous Noah. And what did he bring with him inside the tabernacle? Clean animals to sacrifice, just like Noah did. And when did God instruct Moses to build the tabernacle? During Israel's 40 days in the wilderness. And when did God instruct Noah to build the ark? Right before it rains for 40 days and 40 nights on the earth. Like, None of this is just a quinky dink. Oh, wow, amazing. Instead, like God's showing us something here. Like he's, he's showing us this connection between the ark and the tabernacle and how the ark is a preview, it's a foretaste, it's a small little picture and foreshadowing of the tabernacle that Moses is going to build in Exodus. Like the ark is a tabernacle. It's a, it's a sanctuary. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of safety. It's, it's a place of salvation for Noah and his family to keep them safe and to protect them from the flood of God's judgment, just like the tabernacle in the Old Testament. But that's not all the ark is. The ark doesn't just point forward to the tabernacle that's to come in Exodus. The ark also points us to Jesus. And it points us to Jesus in two ways. First, like, I don't know if you know this or not, but we don't have, a, well, we kind of do. Just stay with me here. We, we don't have a literal, physical ark that we can get into today. And I know what some of you are thinking. That will protect us and keep us safe from the judgment that's going to come when Jesus returns. But we do have something much better. We have Jesus. 
like Jesus is our ark. He's our ark of salvation. He's our ark of safety, of refuge, of salvation at the final judgment. And here's how. Like when Jesus died, he took every drop of God's wrath on himself for all those who would trust in him as their one and only hope for escaping the judgment that they deserve for their sin. Instead of the waters of God's judgment being poured out on you and you drowning in judgment, they were poured out on Jesus and Jesus drowned in your place to death. And so then what that means then is that when Jesus returns now at the final judgment, you're going to be safe and protected because the judgment you deserve has already been poured out. It's already been poured out on Jesus in your place. But again, and this is really important, this is not true for everyone here this morning. It's only true for those who trust and believe in Jesus as their ark of salvation, who trust and believe that he's their only shelter, he's their only protection, and the only one that can preserve and save you from the judgment that would be poured out on you, be poured out in the judgment to come. So again, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I implore you to trust in Jesus as your ark of salvation to rescue you from the judgment you deserve for your sin that will be poured out when Jesus returns. Like that's the first way this passage points us to Jesus. He's our ark of salvation, but it's, it's, it's not just that. It gets even like better. He, he's, not only, he's not only our ark of salvation, he's also the true and better Noah. He's the true and better Noah. Like if you think about this, like it, it makes sense why God allowed Noah into the ark, right? That makes sense. Like Noah was righteous. He was blameless. He, he walked with God while the rest of the world was corrupt and wicked and filled with violence. But if you ever thought about why God allowed Noah's wife and Noah's kids and their wives on the ark? Like, why did God allow them on? Why did God save and rescue them from the flood of judgment? Because nothing's ever said about them being righteous. Nothing's ever said about them being blameless. Nothing's ever said about them being walking with God. So do you know why they were allowed onto the ark? And why they were preserved and saved from the flood of judgment? That they weren't allowed onto the ark because of their righteousness. They were allowed onto the ark because of Noah's righteousness. In other words, Noah is his family's righteous representative. That they weren't allowed onto the ark and let into the ark based on their account. They were let into the ark based on the account of another. And that another was a righteous one. A righteous one by the name of Noah. They were led into the ark and saved from the waters of judgment because they were related to and in the family of the only righteous person on the face of the planet. Noah. He was a righteous representative. And, and this right here is your only hope and my only hope from being saved from the waters of God's judgment that's to come at the final judgment as well. We're not going to be saved because of our righteousness. If it was based on our righteousness, we'd all, be, we'd all drown in the, in, in the waters of God's judgment. And that's why when you read this story here, you should never think that you're Noah. Like, you're not Noah. I'm not Noah. You know who we are in this story? We're the rest of the world. We're the wicked, corrupt ones who, are, who every thought and intention of our hearts are evil continually, who are drowned and who die and whose bodies are sprawled out all on the face of the earth. That's your role and that's who you should identify with and I identify with. That's who we are in this story. 
And so then we're not saved because of our own righteousness. Instead, we're saved the same way that Noah's family was saved. We're saved because of the righteousness of another. And that other one isn't Noah, thank God. Instead, that other one is Jesus. That Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. He was perfectly righteous, perfectly blameless, perfectly walked with God. And now through faith in him, we become part of his family. We become united with him. And he becomes our righteous representative who gives us entrance into the ark of salvation so that we can escape the waters of God's judgment when Jesus returns at the judgment to come. And since this is true then, think about what this means then if you're a Christian. You can rest now securely in your salvation. You can be sure, 100% sure and confident that when Jesus returns and the last judgment comes, you're going to be saved and rescued. And the reason you can rest so securely in that is because your salvation isn't ultimately dependent upon you and your righteousness. It's dependent upon and based on the righteousness of another, namely Jesus. And so is our world growing, ever increasing, wicked and corrupt and twisted and ruined in a thousand different ways? Yes, it is. But at the same time, oh, God gives us in this passage of scripture, in this well-known story, four lessons, four truths that I pray would encourage you Four lessons, four truths that I pray would give you hope. Four lessons, four truths that I pray would kind of reorient your perspective as we navigate our way through the world in which we live. Those who seek to live righteous lives and walk with God are rare in this world. So don't be surprised by that. God sees all the corruption and wickedness in this world. He sees it. He knows. And one day he's going to deal with it. But thank God when he comes to deal with it, that we have an ark of salvation and that there's at least one righteous one still left named Jesus. And that through entering that ark, based upon his righteousness, we will be kept secure and safe and sheltered from his judgment and saved and rescued forever and ever and ever. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this word that you've given to us. Thank you for well-known stories in the Bible that still are relevant for today and that still have so much to teach us and to encourage us. And so, God, I pray that the truths and the lessons that we've been confronted with this morning, Lord, that you would take those, that you would apply those to our hearts. Lord, again, I do pray that if there's anyone here this morning that just doesn't know you as their ark of salvation, Lord, I pray that they would come to trust in Jesus by faith. I pray that they would come and talk to me or somebody else here to explain and to talk more about the hope that they can have, the salvation that they can have in Christ. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us who who are Christians, Lord, that you would use this to just help us to even better understand the, the assurance and the confidence that we can have in our salvation. Lord, the the security that we have in Christ and that we can float through, walk through, journey through and just all that we're experiencing in the world around us and we can do so safely and securely and with hope and encouragement um, because of Christ. It's in his precious name we pray, amen.